Hello! Welcome, welcome back. It's Sarah from Roadworthy. Um, it's another gray day here in Seattle. It's not particularly warm, so I'm probably going to be sorry I'm not wearing my jacket. Uh, busy week. Um, my son has been busy this week. Um, I am trying to do more sketching, so that's taking up time. Um, and then my nephew gets married next week, and so there's all these, you know, events around that. So I don't, it just feels really busy and really hectic. And reading is frankly been my like escape <laughs> from the anarchy. <laughs> um, and you know, thankfully I've had some good, good things this week. Um, with my nephew's wedding next week, I'm not sure how much reading I will actually get done. Um, yeah, we'll have to see. So anyway, I, so anyway, let's just, I don't want to dwell on that. So let me hop to it. Okay. I Who Have Never Known Men by Jacqueline Harpman, translated by Roz Schwartz. This was originally published in 1995 and was just translated and put out by Transit Books in 2022. So I have seen this making the rounds. So this is one of those books, I wouldn't call it enjoyable, but boy, it prompted a lot of thought and a lot of discussion. Actually, my son, husband, and I had a big conversation about this over dinner one night. So, you know, that's a sign of a good book, right? Um, so what is this about? This is about our narrator who is a teenager, I think, you know, young, you know, um, teenager at the start of this book. Um, and she and 39 other women um, are in a cage in an underground bunker. And you don't know why, or, you know, they don't know why, um, they're just living in a cage, right? And they get food and they've got a toilet and they've, you know, um, so they're, so they're taking care of, right? Their bodily needs. Um, but they're not allowed to touch one another. They're any, you know, emotional outbursts are, are quelled by the guards. Um, and our narrator um, doesn't remember ever not being in the cage. So the other women are all older. So they remember being married, having children, uh, and what life was like before the cage. But our narrator does not. I won't go, the plot is very basic, very simple, not a whole lot going on here. But really what this book is about is you know, sort of in the absence of men, culture, societal expectations, formal learning, what do we become? You know, when you strip everything away, do we lose our humanity? Uh, you know, what, what, what about humanity is innate? You know, um, and so anyway, we, we had, that's sort of what we ended up having a lot of discussion about at dinner. Um, but, you know, the, I, I won't obviously give away the ending. I think ultimately, although this book, if I told you the plot, would sound really bleak. It is kind of bleak and grim. But I think, honestly, it's sort of hopeful because our narrator really, despite sort of losing everything, 
um, she's still curious. She's still has, um, she's, you know, obviously smart. Um, she's still compassionate and sympathetic and still wanting to communicate and connect with other people. Um, and I think sort of that's what Hartman is saying is, is ultimately what, what makes us human. Um, and you can strip everything else away and, um, you know, raise us in isolation and we'll still have those desires. So in that sense, you could argue this book is hopeful. Anyway, super interesting book, you know, great book club selection. Um, you know, this is one of those, you know, just super thought provoking um, books, you know, kind of philosophical, but yet gripping. Like I, I think I read this um, in two sittings. So then I will go on to Wandering Stars by Tommy Orange. This is sort of a prequel and a sequel to There There. Um, you know, if you liked There There, you're gonna like Wandering Stars. Um, I think you probably, if you're gonna read both books, it's probably better to read There There first because this book would give away the ending of There There. But I don't think you need to have read There There in order to, you know, read this book. Um, so this is kind of told in two halves. So we've got the first half that starts in 1924, starting with the Sand Creek Massacre in Colorado. Um, and this is where the United States military um, uh, massacres a encampment of Cheyenne and Arapaho, uh, largely elderly women and children. And um, we follow Jude Starr, who is a survivor of the massacre. And, you know, a little bit about him and, and his descendants for two generations. Um, and you, you know, when it's told in, you know, then his children, right, then his grandchildren. Um, and so you can see through this linear progression how the ties to family and culture are being broken. And then in the second half of the book, we skip to 2018 um, and we follow the Red Feather family. And this is the section of the book that comes after the events of They're There. Um, and it, the, the chapters jump from point of view. So to grandmother, great aunt, um, you know, and the red feathered kids. Um, and you see their struggles with trauma, with addiction, um, some of the trials and tribulations of, of being an urban indigenous person in sort of the absence of your tribe. Um, so they're in Oakland and there is an indigenous cultural center, but it's not tribal specific. So although they're able to interact with several other indigenous people, they're not necessarily Cheyenne people. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is, I'm not a big uh, reader who focuses on structure. That's not something I ever notice, but I noticed it with this book. Um, and really that linear progression in the first half and then that bopping around in the second half, I think Orange is really sort of trying to highlight the disconnect that this family 
ultimately suffers. And what happens when you're disconnected from your language, your culture, your family, your tribe, right? Everything is kind of like, you know, chaotic. Um, and I think Orange really uses the structure of this book to, um, to, to highlight that, that message. There are definitely some really poignant parts of this book. You know, Orange's writing is great. Um, you know, this, this is definitely, it's a great book and I'm, I'm sure we'll see this, um, you know, for the National Book Award you know, hit there, there, won the Pulitzer, you know, you, I, I'm sure this will be looked at as well. So, you know, we, we'll, we'll hear more about this book. I never read No More Boats by Felicity Castagna. This was a finalist for the Miles Franklin Literary Award uh, in 2018, and the Miles Franklin is Australia's uh, major literary award. Um, and this is about, um, uh, it's a family book. Um, this is about Rose Antonio and their children, Claire and Francis. And Antonio is a um, immigrant from Italy, um, and his parents were killed in the aftermath of World War II, and so he emigrated in the late 40s, early 50s, um, with a lot of other Europeans uh, emigrated to Australia at that time. Um, and so now here we are. I'm guessing this is the 80s. Honestly, I kind of forgot to look it up and I don't think it specifies in the book. Um, but this is sort of the disintegration of this family. <laughs> um, in the background of uh, what is called the Tampa Affair, and this was um, a event in Australia where about 450 refugees were stranded about 15 miles off the Australian coast while the Australian government debated about whether or not to allow um, these largely Southeast Asian refugees to enter the country. Um, and so, you know, you have the usual you know, no more boats, um, you know, don't let anybody else in, you know, and, you know, and then other people saying that's racist and, you know, we need to help these people. So, so that's going on in the larger context. But what happens here is Antonio uh, is injured in a construction accident. So as an immigrant, he and his buddy Nico end up working construction jobs um, and that's how they support their families and, and they build their houses and Antonio is able to move his family out into the Sydney burbs um, and, and provide for them as a construction worker. And um, so in a construction accident, Antonio is, is injured, um, and so he's permanently disabled, and Nico is killed. And so Antonio is forced to retire, and you can see him sort of struggling with what's his purpose, what's his role, what's his relevance now. Um, and you can see sort of, as he's sort of stuck at home, you can see sort of the cracks in his marriage appearing and Rose's struggles sort of come out. Um, you can see the struggles they have with Francis, who's just sort of this 21 year old 
wayward, you know, he drinks, smokes too much pot, you know, refused to go to college. He's also working construction, but sort of struggling. Um, and then their daughter, Claire, who is the one that they all thought had it together. She had secretly quit her job as a school teacher and is working in a bookstore. Um, and so you see just this whole family sort of falling apart at the seams. Um, and as Antonio is again sort of struggling with his purpose, he grabs on to this Tampa affair. Tampa is the name of the boat. Um, and in becomes a lightning rod for the anti-refugee cause. Um, he sort of does something that that uh, sort of becomes a lightning rod for that. Um, I I liked this. I I I mean I kept going. I kept turning the pages. Um, he, Antonio keeps being visited by Nico's ghost, which I'm not sure that completely worked for me. And I'm not quite sure how I feel about the ending. And the ending feels a little dramatic and a little out there. So not completely successful, but, but I did enjoy this book and it was interesting to read about, you know, the immigration conversation, right? That of course we have here, you know, in the United States and, you know, it's kind of happening in Europe too, you know, it's happening everywhere. Um, so then I read my first book for people, April, Coming Out Dalit by Yushika Dutt. Um, and I read, I saw, her speak at my local bookstore. Um, this book was published in India a couple of years ago and has now been published here in the United States. And she has added some new material for the United States. Um, and she was so um, eloquent and passionate about what she was speaking on that I was super excited to read this book and I'm so glad I did because this was amazing and I felt like it was really important. So this is her memoir talking about growing up in India and hiding her low caste. Um, and she talks about the, the shame and the embarrassment and the attempts of her and her mother, largely, to pass as high caste um, and sort of the, the cost of, of that. Um, and so she talks about that experience. And in, in between that information, she talks about the history of caste in India um, she talks about the evolution of caste under British rule um, and talks about caste today and reservation, uh, which is sort of the equivalent of affirmative action here in the United States. So the Indian government requires in Indian supported schools and in government positions that a certain percentage of students or employees need to be lower caste. Um, and so she talks about sort of the impacts of that. Um, she talks about the history of Dalit activism and the anti-caste movement. So all of this was super interesting um, because of course I knew about caste, but like I never thought about it still being a thing, which is so stupid, right? Like, you know, we think about slavery and um, you know, Jim Crow South. And so again, you, 
sort of if you know that vague history, it almost makes it sound like, well, we don't then have race-based discrimination anymore. We, you know, well, of course we do. <laughs> <laughs> and so again, I felt like, duh, you know, of course there's still caste discrimination in India. Um, so that was incredibly interesting and incredibly insightful. And then she talks about, um, she became a journalist in India and she talks about going to um, applying for and eventually coming to the United States and going to Columbia for a graduate degree in journalism. And she still lives in New York City today. Um, and so she talks about that experience as well. And then she starts to talk about caste in the United States. Um, and this was fascinating. Um, so she focuses primarily on the US tech industry. And um, does not paint a very pretty picture. Um, so she talks about because of caste privilege, most of the early tech workers that came here are high caste Hindus, and how they very systematically. Uh, promoted other high caste Hindus emigrating. And she talks about how there's sort of this old boy network of, uh, you know, Brahmin uh, IIT graduates, you know, India Institute of Technology, which is, you know, sort of the MIT of India, right? And how they, um, have this informal network to basically support one another. And so she talks about the vast majority of tech workers here are Brahmin, which is only 4% of the Indian population. And so she talks about um, lower caste tech workers um, who were only willing to speak anonymously because they fear discrimination, bullying, harassment. They fear their, their career will be jeopardized. In some cases, their H-1B visas will be jeopardized if they complain. And so she had numerous, numerous, numerous examples of people talking about uh, once their uh, Dalit or low caste identity is discovered, how they get poor performance reviews, how denied promotions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I believe that only Apple has in their discrimination policy a prohibition of, of discrimination based on caste. So if you work for Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, you know, these other companies that you're not legally protected because discrimination based on caste, you're not a protected class in this country. There, it is not illegal to discriminate. Um, and so she, she, you know, she really blasts Google, I have to say. Um, for, again, trying to have conversations about caste um, and how high caste employees um, complained vociferously that they were creating a Hindu phobic environment and creating divisions in the company. and basically squelched a lot of efforts to um, raise the issue and have discussions about past. Um, so I, I just, again, living here in Seattle, you know, we have Google, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, right? We have all of these companies um, and there's a lot of Indian people here. Uh, so I just felt like as, as a citizen here, I felt like, oh my God, this is an important issue for me to know and understand. 
Um, the other thing that was really fascinating is she talks about all these social clubs, uh, including one here in Seattle, these sort of secret social clubs for Brahmins only. And again, people talk about how important membership in these clubs is for career growth, um, for social advancement of their families, um, that this is the place where people, oh, oh, let me get you a job for your kid kind of a thing. This is where all of that happens. Um, and, and these clubs are all kind of on the hush-hush. Super fascinating book. And I again, I felt like um, it was really an important book as a white American to uh, start to understand and recognize that caste-based discrimination that exists in India has been uh, imported into our own country. Um, so great, great book. And I urge folks to pick this up for People April. So what else have I got going? Currently in the middle of reading Trash by Sylvia Aguilar Zeleny, translated by J.D. Plucker, Booker. Almost done with this one, enjoying it. Um, I am almost done with uh, Louise Kennedy's short story collection, The End of the World is a Cold Sack. And I will shortly be picking up Margaret McPherson's memoir, Tracking the Caribou Queen, because Lindy from Lindy's Magpie Reads wants to body read this with me. So that'll be next week. So having a great, great, uh, oh, one other thing. I'm listening to um, Cobalt Red. How the Blood of the Congo Powers Our Lives by Siddharth Kara. This is exactly what it sounds like. Um, and it's kind of, it's kind of brutal. And I think I've only listened to like an hour of nine hours. And I feel like there's no way I can make it because it's brutal and horrifying. But I also feel like I have to. So stay tuned for more on that next week. <laughs> all right. Hope you all are having a good weeding break and I will catch you next time. See ya.